Thank you, Svenja. That was a, a wonderful introduction for the whole uh, event. And uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the kind words about Telus World of Science Edmonton. It is a real treat to be here. Welcome to Successes in Neuroscience Online Expo 2023, coming to you from across Alberta. The title of today's symposium is Healthy Brains Across the Lifespan, which gives us a lot of material to cover. I am Alan Nursall. I am the CEO of Telus World of Science Edmonton. Uh, I have spent almost 40 years in the world of science communication through experience development in science centers and television and all sorts of fun things. Uh, I've had a great career doing it. And uh, I should shout out, quick shout out to the Gardner Foundation for yes. supporting works like, work like this and, uh, and not only supporting biomedical research, but supporting the dialogue and discourse around uh, around biomedical science. I also want to acknowledge that our science center where I am right now, Stewart's Lands of Treaty 6 First Nations and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. And it's time to get started. It's uh, We've got a good crew of people that are here waiting, including I'm joined by some, some of my colleagues at Telus World of Science uh, Edmonton who are, who are eager to learn more about uh, Alberta neuroscience and uh, and perhaps ways of engaging with the, the specialists in our newly uh, opened Health Zone uh, Gallery here at the Science Center. First session is Mental Health in Children and Youth. And we features three speakers, as Svenja mentioned, each will get 15 minutes to talk, followed by five minutes of questions, and then a 15 minute panel, panel discussion at the end. And I will magically appear on screen to indicate to all speakers when they have about two minutes left uh, in their time slots. Now across communities, mental health continues to gain more attention. When talking about youth, mental health is one of the most important things to take care of and to nurture. In this session, we will be hearing about different ways to recognize and support better mental health for the young people in our lives. And our first presenter is Dr. David Nicholas from the University of Calgary. Dr. Nicholas joined the Faculty of Social Work in the Central and Northern Alberta region as an associate professor in 2008. He has a background in psychosocial outcome and intervention research related to children, youth, and families affected by illness and disability. He brings expertise in qualitative and mixed method research approaches, and he brings an extensive clinical administrative background in the fields of social work and health and disability. Dr. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Hello. Oh. My apologies. I was having some technical issues here and good to be with you. And I'm I'm David Nicholas. Can you see me okay? Yes. All right. I want to talk to you about mental health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on children, families, and service providers. And uh, I want to just recognize our colleagues who have been a part of this uh, across multiple institutions. Um, I assume my slides are on the screen. Is that right? There we go. There now. Um, and I, I just want to thank the, the the funder of this this research, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and the various funders in Ontario and Alberta. If we go to the next slide, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on children with health vulnerabilities. And uh, I'll describe who I'm defining that group to be, but just want to recognize that the pandemic uh, brought on rapid changes in our health and social delivery care systems with significant implications for us all, but particularly for children and youth and those who support them, their families and their, their health care providers. And as we know, some of those changes included stringent infection control uh, measures and shifts, uh, restrictions in terms of inpatient, inpatient visitation, which had huge impacts for children and in terms of service experience and, and uh, access. Uh, and along with that, the literature speaks about heightened anxiety, fear, isolation, and, and care provider tensions. So the, the healthcare and service provider uh, sector was faced with the, the, the tension of regulatory control in terms of safety versus person and family-centered care. And some of that lived out in terms of um, rigidity of, of requirements and, uh, and inconsistency, the shifts of information and the be benchmarks. If we can go to the next slide, 
I want to talk a little bit about our study. And uh, so we looked at youth populations with health and social vulnerability and resilience. And you'll see on the screen the, the variation. We looked at a breadth of, of, of children and youth, but what they have in common is health and or social vulnerability. And the middle group there is young people um, uh, who were were uh, supported uh, by the Office of Ch Child and Youth Advocate of the Ad so they were children who may be involved in in the child welfare system. They were involved, and and then the other groups either had health or mental health uh, issues. Uh, and so you look at the numbers there. We were sampling a large group of youth parents and healthcare providers, looking at the perceived impact of the pandemic and recommendations and practice guidelines. If we can go to the next slide, recruitment happened, as I said, in two regions, um, in Alberta and Edmonton and Calgary, and in Ontario, in Ottawa and Toronto, and the sites there are listed. Next slide. I want to focus on data collection and how we collected our data, and that was largely qualitative through focus groups with uh, health and social service providers, as well as individual interviews with youth. Uh, and of course, we were in the pandemic, so they were uh, data was collected via Zoom or, or telephone. And you see the numbers of data that I want to speak to this morning. So 49 children and youth, 82 parents, and 205 service providers were part of this. I want to move into the themes. And theme number one uh, that emerged in this data, uh, if we go to the next slide, it was that ex the, the experience of daily life disruptions and adoption of new roles for families create mental health challenges. So no surprise to anyone, the pandemic introduced many disruptions in our lives. And that was uh, particularly challenging for children, youth, and their families. Um, and so the, the isolation that emerged for families, for some, that created all kinds of different uh, challenges and opportunities. So families adopted new roles. Uh, for instance, parents not only were providing support to their children in terms of daily life and healthcare, but also in terms of education and uh, managing other caregiving tasks and, uh, and shifts and challenges. So children might have been struggling with issues of social engagement. If we can go to the next slide, what, the next key area that emerged was a lack of resources uh, that emerged in some of the shifting and the, the, the shutting down that happened in the pandemic, making it challenging for families to adapt to emerging demands. And that had stress and increased mental health issues and uh, there, there was um, some of those issues that emerged was uh, a lack of information and resources to address some of those very shifts that were happening and were imposing stress on individuals, uh, both youth and their families. And, and one of the issues that emerged for children with vulnerabilities was a lack of information on COVID-19 risk in terms of transmission um, and some of the physical and mental health risks, um, and which really imposed challenge for families to guide practice and make decisions about how to move forward in a constructive way. So there's a lot of nebulous and challenge. Um, and, and the information that was available was not particularly tailored to the child's particular health issue. And so the parents were left trying to fend for themselves around how to respond in a way and calibrate the information to their child's particular health needs. If we can go to the next slide, I want to focus on some of the organizational and policy influences that uh, shaped service uh, delivery and uh, influenced mental health challenges. So there was a, 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 a shift in terms of operational protocols, which presented challenges and stress for the service and, and healthcare providers in terms of how to best support families in these adverse situations that there, there, were, there wasn't a script for, there wasn't a guidebook to do this. And, and so the issues for service and healthcare providers in seeking to do the best service they, they knew to do 
in this context, but realizing that that was very challenging and sometimes not possible to do relative to expectations on their self on, on themselves. So, and then adapting to the new realities of care um, for families. So things like school that went online might be suitable and, and, and welcome for some, but for many it was not. And some of the, the impositions, the loss of social connections, um, and, uh, and families drew on the support of resources in their community and the, the pivoting of, of uh, social and healthcare providers to provide service often in, a, in a, a, a virtual way, which presented many challenges, but also stretched us in terms of thinking about how we, provi how we can provide care in, in the breadth of, of uh, ways using uh, technology. If we can go to the next theme, and this is really my last theme, which is the need to think deeply about better supporting youth and families, uh, and, and in particular, thinking about what are essential services in pandemic constrained situations and also enhancing existing service delivery approaches. So really thinking deeply about pandemic planning uh, that is commensurate to the needs of specialized special populations and areas of uh, child and youth vulnerability in their families. So redefine essential services. They tended to be vague and not really focused on the youth uh, youth populations that I'm talking about here. So thinking deeply about that and preparatory planning for pandemic adversity, uh, should we face that again? And history tells us we will. And, and lastly, building service, uh, service capacity. So information availability that is tailored to, to individual uh, child, youth, family and, and broader patient and community needs, uh, thinking deeply about that particular community. I have one more slide that I want to present, which is just some preliminary considerations. So um, as I've spoken about very briefly, there was differential impact. So some youth uh, suffered greatly, some uh, navigated well and adjusted and, and thinking about, we need to think about who are, what are the specific vulnerability populations, but also what are the areas of resilience that we can support in the communities and, and in our communities and, and different populations. There are emerging lessons and opportunities that have emerged from the pandemic. Certainly the use of technology and practice, which is likely to stay uh, to a degree in terms of virtual care and how that becomes integrated with our care processes. The, the, critical role of advocacy and support in terms of dress, addressing the mental health needs of children, youth, and families, and the care providers who uh, are working with them in terms of thinking about both policy and practice. Um, the, the important role of leadership in, in pivoting, as we heard about in the pandemic, proactivity, vision, and strategy, and supporting our, our uh, uh, health care and mental health and community support providers. And lastly, thinking about important areas of research and partnership opportunity and moving forward and, and preparing well for um, experiences like we've gone through in terms of pandemic or other uh, areas of, of uh, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, emergency or disaster and thinking about being prepared with strategies to work forward uh, what, as best as possible in those uh, adverse situations. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. That was a, that was, uh, and a really great uh, dive into the treatment and, um, and, uh, adversity challenges that, that have come through the pandemic. Uh, we have a few minutes, we have five minutes available for questions. I don't see any questions in the Q&A space, um, but if anybody wants to put their hand up or wants to activate their camera to ask a question while we're waiting, I would just, I, I just want to ask about you, in the last slide, you were talking about emerging lessons in, in treatment as a result of the pandemic. You know, in a lot of healthcare discussions, everything comes back to two words, and that's wait times. Are we 
are we still managing wait times for mental health for for children and youth in a way that's that's uh, appropriate? Arthur? Yeah, it's, a, it's such an important question, and I, I I would suggest not that I think there are substantial uh, mental health needs that have emerged uh, that 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 pre-existed the pandemic, but certainly have emerged over the process and thinking deeply about what are the, the, the needs for services that are commensurate with needs and, and thinking about how to ensure timely access to those resources. I think that's a, a system issue that we need to think deeply about in our, in our service provision system more broadly, but also in terms of access to clinical care. And I'm sure there's the lessons that came through, came out of the pandemic are all enormously challenging. Yeah, I, I think one of the things and I touched on it was the role of uh, virtual support and care and thinking about that in terms of potential increased accessibility. It also presents challenges in terms of things like confidentiality and who might be on the other side of the screen. But are there ways to use some of those resources that we had to in the pandemic to actually enhance accessibility uh, to service and care. And we think about our broad geographic reach and, and how we can leverage some of these resources uh, that we now have at our disposal in a better way. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, really good, that's a really good thought to end on. And uh, I think we'll move, we'll roll right into the next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas. Really appreciate that. Uh, we'll roll into the next speaker on our topic of mental health in children and youth, and that is Dr. Jean Addington. And doc, Dr. Addington is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Calgary. She holds the Novartis Chair for Schizophrenia Research at the university, and she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, as well as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Dr. Addington, good to see you this morning. I will turn the table or turn the proceedings over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for having me here today uh, to talk about the research we do. Um, if we could have my slides, um, my focus, our current focus is on youth at risk for psychosis. Um, so let's move to the first slide. So let's think about being at risk for serious mental illness. So most serious mental illnesses begin in adolescence or very early adulthood. And among the most serious mental illnesses are psychotic disorders, in particular schizophrenia. So my research for the past 20 years or more has focused on early detection and intervention for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So what, what does early detection and intervention include? So the first level is early, early intervention as soon as someone develops psychosis. That never used to be the case, but today um, programs do their very best to intervene to help an, an individual right at the very start of, of their psychotic illness. The second level, which is what we're currently working on, is finding individuals who may be at risk for developing psychosis. So being at risk for developing a serious illness is certainly not new in medicine, but it's much less considered you know, in, in, in mental health. So um, let me tell you first a little bit about what is psychosis. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we mean by psychosis? Well, it's a serious, but it's treatable medical condition that reflects a disturbance in brain functioning. Individuals who, who do have psychosis, they have some loss of contact with reality. Um, they may have changes in their thinking, their feeling, their perceptions, and their behavior. Um, about 1% of the population will develop a psychotic illness. And the, the onset typically begins between 16 and 25. And unfortunately, that's a very critical period of, of development for young people, and they really miss out on, on what, you know, healthy uh, young people are, are doing. Now, the symptoms of psychosis include hallucinations, delusions, thought disorder, bizarre behavior, and social deficits. Um, people who, who suffer from psychosis don't necessarily have all of the symptoms, 
Um, many of, of uh, people who do have psychosis end up doing very well. Um, there are many treatments that are very help, helpful for them. So let's move to what um, our research goals are. And next slide. Okay, so we have three key research goals um, in, in our research group. And our research group is focusing on the, uh, this, the second part of early intervention, trying to identify people um, who are at risk of developing a psychotic illness. So our goals are, we have three key goals. We really want to try and determine the predictors and mechanisms of actually developing a psychotic illness. We want to develop interventions that hopefully might prevent psychosis. And we also want to develop and test interventions that may help the wide range of outcomes experienced by these young people at risk of psychosis. Um, move to the next slide, please. So let's think a bit more about at risk for developing psychosis and, and questions around our research goals. Can we actually identify these young people who are most at risk? Yes, we can, but they are difficult to find. And it's, they're difficult to find in that it, it's unclear where they might be seeking treatment. Some of them may not be seeking treatment. They may just be troubled by uh, these early signs and symptoms. Some of them may be tr uh, seeking treatment um, with their family physician or elsewhere where perhaps the, the, the idea that they might be at risk for psychosis is not well known. Second question is, are there early signs or risk factors that might predict a young, that a young person will develop psychosis? And the answer is we have identified a few potential risk factors. And then is there anything we can actually do to, to perhaps prevent the development of psychosis? And our group are currently testing some potential treatments. So let's move to that first question, identifying at-risk youth. So we consider these young people to be at clinical high risk for psychosis. We call it CHR um, because we're identifying them based on clinical symptoms. So it's clinically, we think they're at high risk. They present with psychotic symptoms, but at an attenuated or sub-threshold level. And unlike somebody with psychosis, they're not convinced these symptoms are actually real. An individual with psychosis who is suspicious or hears voices will be convinced that these voices really are there or that someone really is going to harm them. The kind of symptoms we see, and I, in a, a later slide I will give a better explanation, but we're thinking about unusual thought content, suspiciousness, grandiosity, perceptual abnormalities, and disorganized communication. Another risk group that we see is young people who have a first degree relative with schizophrenia. That would be a parent or a sibling who has schizophrenia, plus that young person has had a significant and recent decline in their functioning. That would also be someone we'd be concerned about. So let's move to the, the symptoms. So unusual thought content. This would be like feelings that the world has become strange or unreal. They might think that some people are, are sending special messages. It may be that they just feel that time doesn't seem the same anymore. Um, they get mixed up between what's real and imaginary. Um, they might report that they, they don't know if something really happened or they just imagined it. Um, they might feel that things in the environment have a special special meaning for them. And, and compared to, to other people, they may be more preoccupied with superstitions. But what's important is that we can always induce doubt. Um, we can always discuss with them that these things may not be happening. They themselves may also feel that, you know what, this is what I'm experiencing. But it seems kind of crazy, and I don't think this really happens. I think it's my mind playing tricks on me. The next symptom is perceptual changes. So this is where a young person might 
Um, they may suddenly feel they're more sensitive to light or sounds. Um, they might say, you know, my music has changed. It doesn't sound the way it used to. Or they might start to see patterns and things that they don't think are really there. Sometimes it's as much as hearing a voice that others don't seem to hear or they can't hear. Or they hear unusual sounds that, that are there a lot of the time that they know don't exist or they check out that they don't exist. Or it could be uh, on their body, they feel strange sensations or um, it feels as if electricity is in their veins, but they know that isn't possible. So again, they're having these experiences similar to people with a psychotic illness, but they do know that they're probably not really happening. And on the next slide, some final symptoms. They may have some disorganized speech. It may be that it's a bit vague or odd, or they talk too fast, or they talk too slowly. They may say that they have trouble finding the right word, or, or, or they use an inappropriate word. They might be suspicious. So they're not paranoid, but they feel as if people might be talking about them, or laughing at them, or they might be watched. They may feel that they're in danger. Now, somebody who's psychotic will believe that they're in danger and will believe that the FBI or somebody is after them. At this level, they don't, they can't really put their finger on who might be intending to harm them. It just feels as if they might be at risk. And again, um, you know, they they will, you can induce doubt that these things are really happening. Now, it may be that a, a young person may have all of these symptoms. Sometimes they just have one. Um, they may have it at a very minor level, or it may be at a more severe level and occurring a lot of the time. And it's difficult for them to actually work out, is this really happening or not? But these are the kind of symptoms that we see in people who are at risk of developing psychosis. Um, move to the next slide. So the, next, the second question I asked was, um, are there predictors that these young people who are at risk of psychosis might develop psychosis? Now, what I want you to remember is in our research, we're identifying people who are at risk of developing psychosis and having identified them we want to see are there predictors of, of from the, in this group that might be the link to them going on to develop a psychotic illness. That's very different than research uh, that many epidemiologists do, who look in the um, you know in the general population and look there for predictors of psychosis. We're looking for what might be predictors of psychosis in these people already at risk. Now, most studies follow people for up to a couple of years, although we are now doing one following them from, you know, up to sort of 10 years. But in, in most studies, approximately 15 to 20 percent will develop psychosis within two years. The key factors are high levels of attenuated psychotic symptoms that I just talked about, social functioning, particularly a decline in social functioning. So young people who don't function that well and their functioning starts to decline. Um, difficulties with cognition, um, cannabis use, but most likely very heavy use. Uh, trauma, possibly sexual abuse. And what's important is that um, variables like cannabis and trauma may be predictors of developing psychosis but tend not to be predictors on their own. They tend to need to be uh, in combination with other factors. And in fact, to look at clinical predictors of developing psychosis, it's most likely a combination, a combination of poor verbal memory, unusual thoughts, suspiciousness, and a decline in social functioning. There's also work going on to see if there are any biomarkers that might predict psychosis. Now, the important thing about clinical markers is that, you know, these are easily assessed, identified um, in practitioner's office. But for biomarkers, we're starting to look at blood. Um, we're looking at brain scans and we're looking at electrophysiology. So let me answer my third question on the next slide. 
So is, is what about the outcome? So I did say that approximately 15 to 20 percent will develop psychosis within two years. Of those who don't develop psychosis, so we've identified these young people at risk, but just because they don't develop psychosis doesn't mean that they just go away. Of those who don't develop psychosis, some of them will have remission from these attenuated psychotic symptoms. Others will have fluctuating attenuated psychotic symptoms that sort of come and go and, and don't really go away. Some will develop other psychotic disorders. And unfortunately, some, even when these attenuated psychotic symptoms remit, still have poor functioning. Um, the outcome, the treatment, we want to prevent psychosis and we want to help with other outcomes. Uh, move to the next slide, please. So in terms of, in terms of ongoing treatment studies, um, which we are working on, um, we have, we're looking at support and education, particularly for people with mild symptoms. We're looking at cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, we're looking at cognitive behavior or social skills training that is often delivered in a group format. And we're, we're also looking at family intervention. So we have ongoing projects in all of these areas. And also, we want to try and look at treatments to try and determine how much and what kind of therapies are most effective for CHR youth. So we know that some will not go on to develop psychosis. So how much treatment do these young people need in order to address their concerns, such as their attenuated psychotic symptoms, depression, anxiety, or social functioning? Um, and then if you move to my last slide. Um, and in terms of prediction, we have a, an ongoing project called PRONET. We are one site of a large network of international sites. We're examining all of the heterogeneous outcomes with the aim of developing new treatments, particularly pharmacological treatments. We monitor um, individuals in the study every month with a wide range of clinical outcomes and biomarkers. So this is hopefully going to sort of add to our ability to develop new treatments and perhaps understand uh, predictors and mechanisms even better. So thank you very much for your attention. And on my, la my final slide, um, there is a phone number and an email if anybody wants to know anything else or more details about any of our studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Addington. Uh, that was that was uh, fascinating, and uh, people have really gotten the hang of the question and answer window now. And I think there's there's a couple of questions in there that I think are really good for the panel discussion that comes at the end, uh, particularly around general general questions about access to care. But there's a couple here that I think uh, um, will help us uh, have a good little discussion for the next five minutes while we we're talking questions. And I'll I'll go to the 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 top voted one here. Uh, the symptoms you describe for people at risk of psychosis, how prevalent are they in the general population? And do those symptoms occur in adolescents that are not at risk? Um, some, thing, some things like, I mean, you may have heard about like Voice Hearers Association. Um, there are many people um, in the, well, there are not many, there are people in the general population who do hear voices. Um, the, the hearing of voices don't, doesn't impact their functioning um, and they don't necessarily go on to develop a psychotic illness. Um, of the people we see, um, yes, you know, our original aim was to try and, you know, um, predict psychosis, understand, you know, mechanisms better. But what's been very interesting and what I'm particularly interesting is the 80% that never go on to develop psychosis. And there's a, about a third of them are troubled young people. They still have attenuated symptoms. They have fun, poor functioning. But there is a third that do get better. And I'm trying to understand why these people may have had some symptoms in the first place is it, it, actually an even newer area of sort of research and one that we're actually starting to, to look at. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, 
how can family members and friends best support someone experiencing psychotic symptoms? Um, okay, so if you're asking about psychotic symptoms, um, I think the most important thing is to actually um, get them help at a relevant clinic. And, you know, I in Calgary, there, there's a clinic for young, for young people who are experiencing their first episode of psychosis. I think there's a similar clin clinic in Edmonton. And then there are services beyond that for people who, um, you know, various clinics with names like schizophrenia disorders clinic, etc. And I think the best way to support them it, it, is to work with the clinic. Many of the clinics, especially the first episode clinics, uh, have, have family workers who offer education in terms of understanding psychosis and then helping uh, the families know how best to deal with that person. In our research, I mean, our um, family intervention study, um, we offer education to families so that they understand why their, their you know, son or daughter might be experiencing these symptoms and how best to help them. But I think for full-blown psychotic symptoms, I think the, 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 um, the treaters, treaters, not the right word, are, are the best people to, to, to get information from. And they are available in the province. Right. Thank you. Um, given the nature of the technology we're using right now, this is an interesting question. I, if I look really carefully with my aging eyes, I can see names from Perry. Do you see a role for a chat bot in schizophrenia? There are others for depression and anxiety. For example, whoa bots. Um, yes, there are. Um, there is a... There is an organization um, in the US, I mean, it's worldwide. Um, it comes up if you search for websites on schizophrenia. They actually have a checklist for symptoms. Um, one of the things that we do is we have a checklist about, you know, do you hear voices? Do you see things? Um, that we actually will, sh we do a lot of um, education in the community um, to, to, to help um, workers understand what we're looking for. And we actually have some checklists that we uh, will distribute for them to ask. Um, we have a checklist about more um, psychotic-like symptoms, and, and more psychotic symptoms, and we have a, a screen for more what you'd call psychotic-like symptoms. Um, and I think if, if you want to email that email, I, I can... Um, we can send it on to you if it's something, you know, clinicians want, want to use. Okay. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of the time for Dr. Addington, but we, you will be back. Uh, we're going to go to our third and final presentation uh, in our topic, mental health in children and youth. And our presenter is Dr. Robin Gibb. She has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's and PhD in neuroscience, all from the University of Lethbridge, where she is currently a professor in the Department of Neuroscience. Her research is focused on how prenatal and preconception experience influences brain development and how to improve outcomes for kindergarten children by enhancing early literacy, executive function and self-regulation, and motor skills in preschool children. She has published more than 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, 13 book chapters, and edited two books, one on brain development and the second on language acquisition in children. And... Very importantly, she is a mother of two and a grandmother of seven. So she's got practical experience. <laughs> Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. I need to update my biography. My daughter just had a baby three days ago, so I'm grandmother of eight now. And um, I'm very excited to be here to share with you some of the work that we're doing here in the city of Lethbridge and surrounding community. Uh, my biography stated that we've been working with preschool children. That was something that we've, we've been doing for the past many years. And we've decided to branch out. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So could I have the first slide, please? 
Our organization here in the city of Lethbridge is supported entirely by the city of Lethbridge and it's called Building Brains Together. I've entitled this Talk 2.0 because we've moved from the preschool children and kindergarten age children into looking at supporting executive function in teams through playful activities. So the work that I'm doing, I do in collaboration with Dr. Claudia Gonzalez, who is a professor in kinesiology here at the University of Lethbridge. And I would also like to acknowledge that NSERC supported students who were involved in the project that I'm going to tell you about today. Next slide, please. So I guess the first thing we should talk about are executive functions, as that is our research question. We're interested in trying to determine if these playful curriculum activities that we can introduce to teens can improve their executive function skills. So executive functions are a set of skills that help us define and achieve our goals. And there are three main categories, and those are working memory, cognitive flexibility, and behavioral inhibition. There are subcategories, including problem solving, attention, monitoring, planning and organizing materials, self-regulation, emotional control, and all of these contribute to our executive system. The executive system is supported by the prefrontal cortex, and it is highly connected to the emotional centers in the brain and help us interpret situations that we find ourselves in. We also know that executive functions are more important for school readiness than even IQ, and they predict math and reading competencies of a student going through their academic career. Next slide, please. So work has been done in the past testing uh, executive function skills, and that was done in children between the ages of three and 11, and then they were monitored and followed up as adults. And what they discovered in this research, and this was uh, many research um, ex experiments bundled together, they discovered that adults who had inadequate executive function skills as children had worse mental and physical health outcomes, they earned less money, and they committed more crimes. And all of the studies that were included in this, uh, this larger overview were controlled for IQ, gender, and socioeconomic status. So some years ago now, Terry Moffat and colleagues published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and they made a claim that really caught my attention. And they said that if we could make even small improvements in executive function, that could translate into improvements in health, wealth, and a lower crime rate for a nation. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2022, just this past summer, the Building Brains Together group decided that we would focus our efforts on building a curriculum of games that would be of interest to teenagers, and we piloted that work in a couple of organizations in the city. So this is really following up our success in demonstrating that we could improve executive function, language, and motor skills in preschool children after a minimum of a six-week exposure to our Building Brains Together play curriculum. So we decided to target executive function skills now in children in grades six to nine, also using a play curriculum. And just as point of note, about 70% of Alberta teens are reporting worse mental health now than before the pandemic. And one in four parents report that their teen is showing a decline in mental health. Next slide, please. So there are a few windows of brain plasticity that we find of interest, and particularly plasticity in the prefrontal cortex. So the first window is one that we've examined, and that is in the preschool years and up to age five. And so we do know that the brain is highly plastic at this time, and experiences can modify the way it works and can improve function. So the second period uh, we decided to target now is the adolescent period. And that happens, this, this period of brain plasticity in adolescence happens from about age 12 all the way through to about age 25 or even higher. So that's the target group for this work that I'm telling you about now. Next slide, please. So what do we know about the adolescent brain? 
Well, we do know that it is a work in progress. One of the, the features of an adolescent brain is the prefrontal cortex is going undergoing extensive rewiring, although other areas of the brain are being rewired as well. And that comes into play as a result of exposure to sex hormones that get turned on in this adolescent, pre-adolescent period. One of the reasons we have this wholesale rewiring of the brain is we need to bring the brain from engaging in those childlike behaviors to act more appropriately as adult. Next slide, please. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so if we just measure abilities in adolescence, it turns out that adolescents are the healthiest of all humans, and they also have the most resilient period as far as their physical health goes, it, that they will experience in their entire lifespan. Yet, if we look at morbidity and mortality, it increases about 200 to 300 times from childhood to late adolescence. The, the primary cause of death and disability here is related to problems with control of behavior and emotions, in other words, executive function. Next slide, please. So this is the team that worked with us this summer. We actually have tents that we take out into the community and we pop up at school grounds and we pop up at playgrounds and we stop at senior centers, anywhere that there are people gathering. And we, we have uh, undergraduate students who work with us and we also hire high school students to come and work with us because high school students uh, really seem to be able to relate very well with little ones and they're not afraid to get out and play with them. So um, our team of workers this summer, Kaylee Fleischman, shown on the, um, the left-hand side of the slide, she was one of our students that helped develop this, this teen executive function curriculum. And the second one, Rain Perry, is shown with the hoop, and she was also involved in developing the curriculum. Next slide, please. So the curriculum of games, um, were put together by these two youth and they were selected based on their potential to improve executive function skills while being engaging for 12 to 16 year old participants. The, these two young um, students went into the Youth One program here in the city of Lethbridge and the YMCA and they offered to host a program for adolescents in this playful activity mode and then they asked the adolescents which games they liked, which ones they didn't like, which ones they felt were most challenging and which ones they'd like to do again. And then they also surveyed the, the hosts, the program providers at these organizations and asked them which games they thought were most useful and whether or not they would play these games again. Next slide, please. So the curriculum of games includes a, a mix of very active play as well as seated play. And there's a whole range of challenges for executive function skills. So I have them listed. Uh, Spoons is one of them. It's a card game, dodgeball, which is obviously an active game. Oh, heck, another card game. Concentration in an animal version and then a number version. The game Slap is also a card game. Blindfold Lego, you see a picture of that here. A uh, one word story with a ball. So people sit in a circle and you add a, add a story, a word to a story when the ball comes to you. And rock, paper, scissors, tag, uh, again, an active game. And one tap, two tap is also an active game. These games are available on our Building Brains website. So if anybody is interested, you can sign up for them on buildingbrains.ca. Next slide, please. So Kane and, uh, Kaylee and Rain presented their work at the Canadian Undergraduate Research uh, Conference in uh, Kelowna this past September, and they won first prize for their poster presentation. So they were actually assessing the Stroop uh, color word test as a quick test of executive function. They didn't reach significance with their findings. They didn't have enough participants likely, but they did demonstrate a very strong potential of this play program. So what was most important is participants were able to share which games they liked the most and which games they should get rid of. So overall, uh, we got some excellent feedback on the programming. Next slide, please. 
So right at the moment, we, uh, we have memorandums of understanding with both of our school divisions here at the city, uh, in the city of Lethbridge. And this curriculum of adolescence games is being evaluated at Gilbert Patterson Middle School. So we have one classroom of children who are receiving the active games and one classroom of children who are just getting pre-testing and post-testing uh, while the um, the games ensue in the class that are being exposed to them. So we are collecting pre-assessments for executive function, memory, problem solving, and motor skills using the NIH toolbox tool. And we also use a Lego model reconstruction tool. The adolescents will play these games for about three months and will conduct the post assessments in May or June and gather teacher feedback on the use of the curriculum in the classroom. So I just wanted to highlight that in the schools, Jade Oldfield is a learning support teacher. She's also a graduate student in my lab and she is coordinating all of the executive function assessments for uh, the element, or sorry, for the teen, uh, the teenagers. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to add that we're also doing a Chess for Life program, and this is in conjunction with Dr. Lance Gregg, who has been running this program for several years now, and again with Dr. Claudia Gonzalez. The Chess for Life program is aimed at assessing executive function in justice-involved youth prior to an exposure to uh, exec, uh, a chess game, or chess mentoring, sorry. And this Chess for Life goes on for about 25 hours. So the justice-involved youth that we're looking at are between the ages of 12 and 30, and uh, we're getting an assessment of their executive function and memory skills, very similar to what I just shared with you uh, for the BBT. And uh, then we're looking at post-chess programming, how we change their executive function skills and other cognitive skills. Next slide, please. So these, these justice-involved youth are sentenced to 25 hours of chess with a mentor. They come to the U of L for weeks each week, or two hours each week. They're provided with food and drink, and there are pre and post program assessments, and all of that is still underway as well. Next slide, please. Yes. So the greatest opportunity here is also a period of time where we have greatest vulnerability. This is a quote from Dr. Jay Geed. Uh, could you just click it one more time? As the adolescent brain is reconfigured, it is more susceptible to long lasting damage of drugs, alcohol and negative experiences. Unfortunately, the brain is most vulnerable at a time when they're most inclined to take risks and to act impulsively. So we are working at, on this play, teenage play curriculum, looking at this period of development as a great opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gibb. That was, that was wonderful. That was, uh, um, it's, it's, it's inspiring to see the word play come into the, the realm of treatment and, uh, and, and breakthroughs like you're talking about. There are a couple of questions that uh, appeared right near the very end of, your, uh, end of your talk, and I can bring those to your attention. Here's one from Renee. I'm familiar with most of the games included in the program. Has there been a change in the amount of play teens are engaging and that is affecting EF development versus previous years or decades? We are actually asking our participants to keep a play journal. So we're trying to keep track of how much they're playing. And we're also asking teachers to keep track of how much they're using the play because they're doing it in the classroom. So we're asking them to keep, give us an idea of what doses they're using. But we'd like at the end of the program for our participants to tell us whether or not they're increasing their amount of play and if they're using the games outside of the classroom as well. Um, I'm not sure if play is more widely used now than in previous years, but it clearly is a wonderful way to help manage symptoms of mental health and to, uh, mental illness, sorry, and to actually support teenagers in their development of these life skills that can serve them as they get older. And in, in, a, in a similar vein, do you think, this is from Veronica, do you think bringing these games to a neuro rehabilitation unit will aid stroke and brain injury survivors, especially those 
with damage to the left frontal lobe, also known as the, as the executive function brain area. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've spent the early part of my career looking at brain injury and how we can enhance recovery after brain injury. We now know that one of the best things you can do for a developing human and developing all the way into the years, 30 plus years, is to have strong nurturing relationships, which come about with play, and to engage in activities that are challenging those executive functions. So we try to combine those two things and approach the executive function skills from a, a variety of different uh, angles in order to, to ensure that we're working with children to help them establish those connections that will, will serve them later on. And that we, what I know from the work that we've done with, in animal models of brain injury is uh, injured brain is more receptive to these environmental inputs than is an intact brain. And so the chances are that you could make a huge difference for people who have suffered some sort of brain injury. And even if it is in the left prefrontal cortex, and I so appreciate you mentioning that because we are currently working on a paper talking about how uh, executive function seems to be very lateralized in based on some of the findings that we made in the work that we've done. And in a similar vein, one more question, I think, before we bring everybody back, the, the entire panel back. Can any of these games be used in rehabilitation and development of executive function in children and youth on the autism spectrum? Uh, to be honest, yes, I do believe this, this can make a difference. So we, this summer, actually targeted children who had various levels of abilities. We encouraged uh, children who were enrolled in programs uh, with autism and physical disabilities and ADHD to come and play with us. And we were able to serve them and they had so much fun. And when you're having fun, your brain is wide open to those learning possibilities. And so the, the games have a teaching component and these children as they're having fun are learning. And I'm sure we didn't do testing on them, but my gut feeling here is that they would benefit terrifically from a program such as this. Play is powerful stuff, and uh, I want to I want to encourage uh, all the participants who are who are uh, active with the uh, reaction emojis. It's good to see it's good to see the the audience is uh, engaged, and there there come the thumbs up and the hearts yeah, and, yeah. and so on. That's great. Now we need to transition a little bit, um, and we want to bring back the entire panel. Uh, and uh, I'm sort of at the at the the whim the whim of the uh, here we go it's all work it's, uh, the folks behind the scenes have got this totally locked down this is great um, we've got uh, about 15 minutes we're we're all five minutes behind schedule but we're doing we're doing pretty good big thank you to the presenters for staying to your 15 minute time slots that was you were all bang on with that um, and I, I let me see if I can find the the a couple of questions here. Um, I, I think this. I think this applies. I think it came from was triggered by Dr. Nicholas's um, session, but I think it applies across everybody's uh, sessions. Um, and this was the the notion of access to culturally appropriate care. Um, and I think I'm going to throw it to you first, Dr. Nicholas. Just was there in in the pandemic? Was there an issue? Uh, or an, an effect of the pandemic on access to culturally appropriate care for patients? Mm -hmm. Such a great question. And I think it's, a, it's an important question, certainly relative to the pandemic, but more broadly. Um, but I, I think that some of the, the strains and the challenges of the pandemic uh, reflected elements of intersectional issues. So when there were other barriers that individuals were facing in their lives, um, they might have had a, an amplifying effect in, in terms of some of the challenges. And so if it was um, sociocultural or community issues, there might have been heightened um, isolation. Um, there might have been um, increased bullying uh, or uh, the, 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 the impacts of isolation from one's own community. Uh, and so I, I, I think that, uh, that, you know, I, I think that's, a, it's, it's an important issue that we looked at. We, in our particular study, we were, we're 
quite inclusive across demographics. So we didn't specifically look at particular issues um, across cultural areas of, of difference. Um, but what we saw were these kind of additive challenges that would happen for particularly communities that were, were isolated or faced barriers in other ways in, in terms of the community. Dr. Gibber, Dr. Addington, is there anything you wanted to add to that? We've tried to be sensitive to various cultural groups with our play programs. So we have them translated into Swahili and Arabic and Blackfoot and French and Spanish and trying to make everyone uh, involved in this in making sure that they understand that this is something everyone can do and we have a coordinator who is spends all of her time working with blackfoot uh, families and blackfoot elders uh, interpreting games that are traditional games with them and trying then we try to understand how these games can support executive function so we do try to be culturally sensitive we also work with the lethbridge immigrant society and we uh, work with our first uh, for newcomers uh, one of the first agencies they come to is uh work well, they come to our play events so we do try to to be an inclusive group and provide everybody with what they need as far as the, their culture goes okay. Um, Dr. Gibb, you or Dr. Addington, do you have anything you want to add on that? Um, so one of, I mean, we do try and be culturally sensitive, but one of the difficulties with um, psychosis is that different cultural groups have different beliefs, and um, you know may you know may not come forward, may want to keep it within the family. Um, for some cultural groups, it's more of a, a shameful thing than, say, in, in other groups. So it is actually difficult, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, there's another question here that I, th I think cuts across uh, all three of you. Um, Dr. Gibb was the only one who specifically talked about brain plasticity, but it's such an issue with, with, uh, with brain development. And although... Plasticity, let me just see if I've got this correct. Although plasticity is limited in the between, in the, oh. I think there might be a little a bit of a syntax error. <laughs> um, plasticity is limited in the window of five to 12 compared with other ranges. Is there, is there a desire to continue the executive function work in this period? Yes, absolutely. So that, that's a great question. It seems like we're leaving out a whole host of children that are in grade one up until grade five. And uh, we intend to use a blend of the teen program and the early uh, preschool program uh, to find out what appeals the most to children in this age group and then provide those play opportunities and that curriculum to teachers who are willing to take it on. So our first order of attack here is always within the school system. And then the second order of attack is to get it out to parents, making sure that parents understand that these playful activities with their teens at home or their preschoolers at home can have a huge benefit for their children. Dr. Nicholas, Dr. Addington, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I, I would just say, you know, one of the things that emerged in our data was that um, that in in the adversity of uh, my focus was on our focus was on pandemic, the 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 kind of isolation at, at certain junctures through the pandemic on uh, the shutdown of other resources. And in some cases, the engagement of families in new ways, they, they were uh, mm -hmm. cloistered at home. And uh, so some of that engagement was was a silver lining in terms of some for some families having that time together to engage. And I was thinking about that while Dr. Gibb was presenting that 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 time of of parents engagement with schooling with with play with uh so some of those natural environments within the home notwithstanding the tremendous barriers that had on families you know the 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 additive responsibility on parents and and the stresses but also 
providing opportunities for some of those those natural opportunities within the context and thinking about how can we emulate both support to families in moving forward but also that that community context and um, so i dr gibb i don't know i i really appreciate you some of your comments and thinking about how do we integrate that within the context of family life in an ongoing way and particularly in times of adversity as a community we see a lot of parents coming out to our public events wanting to learn more because they didn't realize that they had that big an effect on their children when they engage with them in these these playful activities so uh, it's something people want to know and i think you're right the pandemic when everyone was at home they realized that this was a wonderful opportunity to share more things together and so so i i do believe it, there is value here there's a great question here that I really think applies to all three of you. Um, and maybe Dr. Addington, you'd be a good one to start this. Um, and it's, and it's about engaging with youth. What is the best way to engage a fearful, there is nothing wrong with me youth? Um, yeah, I think that, I think that's a, a yeah, a, a difficult question. Um, I think for the young people we see, more often than not, they're wanting some help um, versus, you know, it being their family. I, it might be the nature of attenuated psychotic symptoms. These are something that they're experiencing. It's not necessarily so obvious, um, you know, to, to say their family because their internal thoughts or experiences. Um, I think, like, sometimes we find that, that, that young people, they, they're fine with being in a study. They like the idea of coming to a study, um, which seems to them a bit better than going to a clinic. Um, they don't necessarily want to go, go to a clinic. Um, we generally don't have a lot of issues sort of engaging um, the young people we see uh, to come. We also have a, a clinic um, as a research clinic for people who may be at risk for any mental illness. Um, in that, through that clinic, we just offer assessments and, and then and then give sort of feedback um, to uh, you know to, to whoever you know whoever would want the feedback, and then they can follow up. We don't we we're not able to make referrals or things, um, but generally, I think for at risk things. It's, Engagement's a little bit easier um, than, than parents perhaps thinking, you know, my, my child isn't doing as well as they should or um, and, and taking them along to some resources. Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Nicholas, engaging fearful youth. Well, I, I would add, um, I, I, to me, one of the issues is starting where the youth is at so what are the what are the areas of particular interest and engagement for that youth and and starting that that uh conversation on their terms the other thing that i i've noticed in some of our work this particular study but also others is youth are helpful commentators on what matters to youth and what are the issues in our in our community and society that matter and and what are the the challenges to be overcome and and to really listening to youth well and giving them that opportunity to to inform us about that and i i've i i recently participated in a, in a group where i was so inspired by youth's um acumen and thinking deeply about our communities and and what they would like to see different so i think listening well is is really Mm -hmm. we, we did send out surveys to both of our school districts and we managed to get back over 600 surveys from adolescents who told us what they thought was important as far as play goes, what they thought sucked, and they also told us uh, what were the barriers for play. And so it gave us a good heads up when we started to assemble this curriculum. It wasn't just targeting at, at uh, adolescents who are fearful, though, and that is a real issue. Uh, we, we know that more and more of them are suffering from anxiety than ever before. And so we do try to be sensitive to that in 
But I, I hope that at least some of those surveys came back from children who had that as a barrier. They were afraid to, um, you know, just let it all go and interact. And well, some of the students did comment that they were afraid of what their peers might think of them if they let it all go in a playful situation. So, okay. One last question uh, with a with a brief answer from each of you. We'll go in the same order. We'll go. We'll start with you, Dr. Addington. This is since we're talking about children and youth. Do you have any advice for parents or caregivers when it comes to managing mental health of their of their children and young people? Um. So I I, I think the first thing would be to to listen to what they have to say. Um, and, and acknowledge, um, I, 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 you know, I mean, it may be very concerning for a parent to hear that, that their child is hearing voices, but I think it would be not necessarily to normalize it, but to normalize the fact that they're, they're disclosing something and just help them go to where they'd most likely want to go to get help, um, but not sort of panic. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, and maybe the other side of that is to be proactive in terms of addressing things that come. And um, the, the other thing I would, I would wonder about is really, uh, along with what Dr. Addin Addington said, to listen well and to have resources and activities in the community that really resonate for that youth in terms of things that help them to, to grow and thrive on their terms uh, in the community. That's word to you, Dr. Gibb. Okay, I'm gonna say, don't be afraid of teenagers. They may be difficult to understand, but don't be afraid of them because you need to maintain a strong, healthy, positive relationship with them in order to bring them through that period where they're vulnerable and make sure they come out the other side, having built a brain that's going to serve them well. Okay. Well, thank you to all three of you for a really great session and uh, let the you know, launch the uh, reaction emojis. People let, let people know what you th the presenters know what you think. Um, this is great. We are going to take a, uh, it's 1123. We're going to take slightly shorter than 10 minute break. We'll try to get back here at about uh, just, 11.30 or shortly thereafter, to go to session number two, Psychedelics, Cannabis, and the Brain. So again, thank you to the presenters, and we will see you all in slightly under 10 minutes. Thank you.